Hey everyone, it's Colin, how's it going? I seem to have a love-hate relationship with cassettes. They're great for nostalgia, but the players I've gotten so far have proven to be a challenge to get working. So naturally, I bought another one. Several, actually. I picked them up from Yahoo Auctions Japan, and we'll take a look at the others in future episodes. This one is a Sony WM-EX 511, which was released in November 1994 and seemingly re-released in 1995 as the EX 618. It's overall in good condition, with some light scratching, but also has an unfortunate dent on the front panel. It included the external battery attachment, which lets you drop in a AA for extra runtime. But to make the player more pocketable, it could be detached and a rechargeable gumstick battery would fit inside the Walkman itself. The player felt a little heavy when I picked it up, and here's why. It had a tape left in it. We'll check out what's on it later. The inside looked fairly clean with just a bit of dust. The tape heads don't show much wear at all, and the rollers are still in good shape. The controls are pretty straightforward, with transport buttons and the hold switch on the front panel, and the volume limiting switch on the top. The left side has the volume wheel and a switch for two levels of bass boost. There's also a more recognizable remote control connector next to the headphone jack. Sony would use this same style in portable CD and mini-disc players for years to come. Previous Walkman models had a different, more bulky style of connector for the remote. The Dolby noise reduction and blank skip switches are inside the cassette compartment, and these white tabs let the player figure out what type of tape has been inserted. Ferric, chrome, and metal tapes have different notches in the top, specifically for this reason. Okay, let's test it out. I dropped in a tape and pressed play. The Walkman tried to play it, but only made some mechanical grinding noises. The tape wasn't moving. I knew exactly what this was caused by, and honestly, I had pretty much expected it to happen. I used the JIS screwdriver to remove the two screws from the bottom of the front panel, then the single screw by the battery compartment. One of the screws on the top was missing when I got the player, and the others I had already unscrewed weren't very tight. Seems like someone's been in here, and I could only hope that they had just taken a peek inside and changed their mind. I got the last screw removed, then I could lift the cover free. Well, not quite. Unlike players I've taken apart in the past, this one requires removing the battery compartment door first. Then the cover could come off, and yep, exactly the problem I thought it had. This belt is way past its prime, and needs to be replaced. Thankfully, the rest of the insides looked good. There was no sign of corrosion on the battery terminals, and aside from some dust, it doesn't look like anyone's been tinkering in here. I had ordered a new belt ahead of time so I could keep going with the repair. The old one came off mostly in just a few big pieces, though some got stuck to one of the pulleys. I had to scrape it out using a spudger. Installing the new belt is a little tricky. The way this battery contact is designed, the belt has to pass through these two openings. One option could be to remove the PCB, but I took the easier approach, which the service manual also recommended by simply desoldering the contact. Then I could easily route the new belt and hook it around the motor spindle, and then just solder the contact back into place. I wanted to do something about that dent while I had the player apart. The casing is made out of aluminum, which is fairly soft, and I first tried rolling my screwdriver handle over the back of the dent, but that only seemed to make scratches. I found another plastic-handled screwdriver with a somewhat convex end, and carefully pressed it against the dent. And that actually worked, for the most part at least. It's definitely not perfect, but the dent is smaller than before. I can live with this. Reassembly was straightforward. Some of the screws are different lengths, but there aren't many of them, so it was easy to keep track of what went where. I wanted to try to find a screw to match the missing one from the top. 
I had another Walkman, a WM-EX10, which had a broken tape door that I could use for parts. This was a low-end, inexpensive model, and I thought there might be a similar screw inside it I could pilfer. The entire outside is plastic, and I found that only clips held it together. It took a little while to release them with a spudger, but eventually I was able to get the back cover off, and this thing's even simpler inside than I had thought. All of the gears and flywheels are plastic, though interestingly, the belt is just fine. And this model is from 1991. Looks like a battery leaked in here long ago, but never got cleaned up because of how hard this terminal is to access when the players put together. It's clear Sony designed this model for quick assembly, because the PCB and transport mechanism simply lift out from the front panel. No screws. There's not much on this PCB, and there aren't even any screws holding it down, just plastic tabs through these notches. Only two chips are needed in this player. The first is an LA4571M, which is the stereo amplifier chip for the headphone jack. The other is what looks like a power management IC from microchip technology, probably used to regulate the voltage from the batteries as they discharge. And that's it. Sony really built this player down to a price, so much so that there are literally only two screws in the entire thing. These ones holding in the motor. They're the wrong size for what I need, unfortunately, so I got the player snapped back together. I'll find a replacement for the missing screw another day. I was getting a little bored with my usual test tape, so I recorded a new one using a deck I had previously fixed. Was the new belt all that this Walkman needed? I certainly hoped so. Sometimes fixing these is deceptively easy, but other times it's an absolute nightmare due to their small size and complexity. And thankfully, it seems like I lucked out this time. The tape played just fine. I did notice that it was running a bit slow, though. Sometimes letting the deck play for a while can loosen things up, but in this case, that didn't help. I got the player open back up so I could access the speed adjustment. The service manual indicated that the trimmer for this was located on the back side of the PCB, so I started to work on removing it. I took out two screws that hold the board in, then disconnected the flat flex from the tape head. But then I realized Sony had designed in a shortcut, a hole through the PCB so that the trimmer could be accessed without flipping the board over. The best way to get the correct tape speed is with a calibrated test cassette and something like an oscilloscope or frequency measurement software. I didn't have a speed test tape, so I adjusted the Walkman at first by ear, then got it closer by using a tempo app to compare the BPM of the song against the digital version. I'll get one of those tapes on order, but for now, this is close enough. Oh, and here's what was on that tape included with the player, in case you're curious. The audio playback otherwise didn't have any problems. This is in stark contrast to the last Walkman I worked on where bad capacitors caused some issues. Turns out, with the EX511 at least, this won't be a concern because the parts listing in the service manual only shows ceramic and tantalum capacitors, which fail far less frequently than the electrolytics I had to replace last time. I don't know why Sony changed which caps they used with the 511, but I'm certainly glad they did. Fully working vintage Walkmans like this one can often go for a lot of money. But because I bought this one as untested and likely needing repair, I saved a lot. 
I won the Japanese auction for the equivalent of about $15 US, and with shipping and proxy buyer fees, this player cost about $35. Bucks. The belt was an additional $10 with postage, so for less than $50 total, I have a working Walkman that's in pretty good shape. Buying these parts units is always a gamble. Sometimes you win and sometimes you lose. I've seen both sides of this, and though it can sometimes be very frustrating, I found the process interesting. Even if you can't get the device working, there's a good chance you'll still learn something. And if you can end up with a working Walkman out of it for a good price, well, maybe it's a risk worth taking. If you liked the video, I'd appreciate a thumbs up and be sure to subscribe. You can follow me on social media at thisdoesnotcomp. And as always, thanks for watching.